This program proudly brought to you by the Also Foundation, developing the lesbian and gay community for over 15 years. Welcome to Queer Zone. We have another fabulous action-packed program for you this evening. And I'm sitting here this afternoon with my co-presenter, young Daniel. How are you, Daniel? I'm good, thanks, Lindsay. And how are you? I'm feeling very fabulous because you know where we are today? Yes, I do. We're in Spring Street. And on Spring Street near the corner of Turnbull Dyke Alley with a fabulous Japanese wedding happening behind us. What do you think of that, Daniel? They've actually just taken off. They've vanished on us. Oh, the bastards, how dare they? Well, we're very lucky because there's someone coming along now. We might be able to get them in shot. And while we're waiting for them to pass, our first program for you tonight is Lashings of Whipped Cream. And then we go to Born in a Taxi. Were you born in a taxi at all, Lindsay? No, Daniel, in actual fact, I was found. And sorry about the distraction, but here come some more wedding people. We are so lucky to have a whole cast here for us. Would you like to just come into screen for a split second? Here we go. These people are actually going to a wedding. And do you know you're on Quip? You've been. Yeah, we're do you... just doing the fun stuff now. Oh, well, you're on, on gay television. How does that feel? Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, yes, I have flowers too. Can I catch the bouquet? <laughs> Not yet. We still we need them. Tossing, oh, right. Well, here we go into lashings of whipped cream. experience like you as a person or is it just sort of you do this on stage or you actually well I I'm I do not don't practice B and D though you never know after the show <laughs> I feel like a Sunday school teacher that's bondage and discipline children which is pretty much what it sounds like I tie you up and I punish you physical punishment I've got a selection of equipment, as you can see, and that's a pretty good all-rounder. I can do that for you for a couple of hundred bucks. Basic bondage, basic discipline, both 200, reduction for regulars. What relates to me is the fact that it's really human and it does, she doesn't judge anybody, and so the, back, the backdrop of B&D is so fascinating because I, I just don't... When I meet people who are really judgmental of other people, I just kind of wonder who they think they are. Genital torture, 225. Now that is a price hike, but it is more gruelling for me. I have to squeeze them into these little clamps. Oh, it's quite fiddly. So how did you research the role? Well, I've got a really dear friend who I did a play with in New Zealand and she was a uh, practicing mistress, Mistress Sadika, and she had a dungeon at the time in Fitzroy and uh, I met with her and we got all the gear and uh, this is all her gear actually she um, the dungeon closed and she lent us all the gear and um, she was fantastic she yeah I know I'm like wow <laughs> golden shower 225 I really need to know if I've got one of these coming up though because I have to drink a bit beforehand have had a coffee of course but it would be a wee while before I could produce for you. I really like these though, because when I was a kid, I was a bit of a tomboy. And it always used to hack me off that I couldn't piss standing up. So there's the job satisfaction. There. <laughs> and at the beginning, it's really interesting. 
I was quite, you know, like, oh, you know, oh, scary. But that's, I pretty learned pretty quickly that that's not what the stuff's about at all. It's about completely taking control of it and going for it. Oh, now, also, just to finish off, in case you're interested, anal stimulation and caning, 250 bucks. So, no takers? Don't worry. It's no skin off my back either way. So do you think um, the show has a large degree of educational material in it for about B&D and SNM for the audience? Heaps. I mean, it's actually all informative from the beginning till the end because um, we've tried to set it up so that the audience actually does experience being dominated. So even to that, that feeling um, is educational for some people. Um, and also, like, I go through different services that, that I offer and oh, one of the things I think is really exciting is about the fantasies, about the fact that this is just, <laughs> it's just playing out your fantasies and some people are so scared of, of so scared of them. It's incredible. Like I say, you know, close your eyes and let's have some fun and some people just, nah, they won't take the challenge. And it's, um, yeah, and it's that whole thing about the fact that that's what her job is, that, that, that you live fantasies in, in the dungeon. That's, that's what it is. So just to set your minds completely at rest, I'll explain my system. Because what you might not realise is that you are totally in control. Guys don't come in here just so I can belt the shit out of them. I know, that's what people think. But it's a bit more refined than that. It's a bit more of a game. And underneath, you are in control. Because you're the one that's asking for it. You're the one that's paying. So, if you want me to chain you to the wall and put your three-piece suit in a vice, I will. You want me to stop? I'll stop. And so there's no confusion on that score whatsoever. I have my very own certified, patented barometer of agony right here. High tech, eh? I give you one of these because if I'm blindfolding you or gagging you, you might have some trouble with the catchphrase, which is mercy, mistress, mercy. Easy to remember, not a problem. But if you've got a mouthful of something, I might not quite catch it. So what you do is you drop the ball, right? Eh? Just drop the ball. I was reading um, a newspaper article on the show and it said that um, in 1993 there was a, a death, you know, related to B&D um, around the time that your show was actually playing. Yeah. What happened with that? Well, it was when Fiona Samuel did it, but she wrote this play be because of it. In New Zealand there was a cricket umpire and he was found over the Hooker Falls um, and he actually had water in his lungs. So in actual fact, they hadn't killed him in the dungeon, but they thought that they had. He, they'd strung him up and left him there, went upstairs and had fish and chips, came back down, thought he was dead, put him in the back of the car, drove down, dumped him. And um, oh, the whole of New Zealand, it was like um, Jaden Lesky. Yeah, everyone was just, my God, it was so fascinated by it. I think that this is really challenging um, role for me to play and it shows lots of different diversity like there's some really moving moments and some really f uh, full-on humorous moments and and I've really studied this part. Well it was a fabulous performance, Lashings of Whipped Cream at the Universal Theatre and uh, just fabulous, thank you very much for talking to us and I don't know what we're going to again. Now, wasn't that fabulous, Dan Daniel? I nearly forgot your name there. <laughs> Lashings of whipped cream. Now, do you get into any leather at all? No, I don't. I'm very boring, unfortunately. Oh, that's a bit sad. I won't even ask what you're into. Now, next we have coming up... Uh, born in a taxi. 
which uh, is a play, I believe, and it's about being born in a taxi, of which you, we ascertained that you were born. I was born in a hospital. Can you tell us which one? No, I don't remember. Oh, well, I do. As I said, I was found in a cabbage patch where all lovely lesbians are found. Here we go with Born in a Taxi. I'm Duncan, and after seeing the Melbourne Theatre Group Born in a Taxi, I was absolutely desperate to get an interview with them, and finally I've got them. <laughs> Yay! 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 I've got Penny, Richard and Carolyn. So, guys, for those of the public that haven't heard of Born in a Taxi, what's the nature of the performance? It's improvised dance theatre. Okay. In a nutshell. Incorporating clowning and miming and dance. And theatre. <laughs> Taxi's been going for eight years, okay. and I've been with Taxi for five. Mm -hmm. I've been with Taxi for a year and a half. And I've been with Taxi for a year and a half as well. Okay. Yeah. And over those eight years, have you seen it change very much? Or over the five years at least that you've been with them? Um, yes. Have I seen it change? Yeah, no, it has. It, we, I mean, we're primarily an indoor impro group, mm -hmm. and um, our work's always developing. It's always, um, every show's different, so that okay. really helps. Yeah, but that's something that I really noticed when I came in. It was so good to see new, fresh, li fresh life in the show. And I think that would be one thing that would attract young audiences, especially. Yeah, actually, that's new, getting young audiences, and I think that's largely due to the new, two young, new members. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> seems to have brought a younger crowd. <laughs> but I think, I, I mean, I honestly believe that, that our style of theatre is, is the future because it, it has got the freshness and the authenticity of, um, that, that comes with improvisation, which I don't think, I don't think many other people are actually doing, certainly not many companies, like we're definitely at the forefront of, of what we do. We have um, a, whole, a whole vocabulary between our group that we have, discovered over the last eight years um, in terms of structures of some of them of something like school of fish when to um, when to be together when to let a solo happen how to do support how to recognize events it's like having five directors working the piece because everyone's working try, trying to think from outside the piece while being inside it so i've got to ask how did that come about well, Born in a Taxi, we had a friend years ago who's a real wordsmith okay. and he did a lot of improv. He wasn't in Taxi and we went along and said, let's he had, a, he had a list of names and Born in a Taxi was there and, was there. and that was catchy, it. And you know, as soon as I heard it I was like, God, what is that? Yeah. I started doing dance when I was 20, mm -hmm. I did that for two years and then I moved, I'm from New Zealand, I, I moved here and I, I wasn't really interested in I don't know, I found the dance classes really dry. So I went to El Wonder, who runs the studio where the performance is. Yep. He, um, he has movement impro classes, and okay. I just started with that. And um, I never turned back, just been doing that. And John Bolton Theatre School as well. Okay. And I do sort of cabaret and other sort of comedy stuff. Mm -hmm. And what about you guys? What, what brought you to it? Um, originally, we st um, me and Rich started performing together as a duo on the street, basically. Okay. We didn't Doing improvisation or...? Yeah, impro and yeah. movement, and we just went travelling around Asia and just decided to do street theatre, so wow. we spent about a couple of years just doing street work without much training at all, and then we went, ooh! I guess you learn pretty quick if people either give you money or don't <laughs> give you money. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a steep learning curve <laughs> out there on the street. Uh, but then it gets to a point where you learn as much as you can on your own, and you want to go to someone else, so we went to... London and we studied kind of clowning and um, mm -hmm. physical theatre and mime. And has that always been in your blood? Have you always been the show off in the family or? Richard, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, it could be said to be true.